is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Live from London, this is Global Business. Hello, welcome to the program. I'm Jamie Owen. And I'm Robin Dwyer. Our top stories. Fighting intensifies in the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, where the few remaining residents are struggling without power or water. We have an exclusive report. Our other headlines, China's President Xi and Russia's Vladimir Putin hold video talks on trade, geopolitics and the war in Ukraine. China appoints a new foreign minister. Veteran politician Qin Gang is to be the country's top diplomat. Following Italy's lead, Spain is now requiring visitors from China to produce a negative COVID test or be fully vaccinated on arrival. And farewell to the king. Brazil and the world mourns after the death of football superstar Pele. Fierce fighting in the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut has intensified as Ukrainian troops continue advancing against Russian reinforcements. The city adjacent to Russian-controlled areas has seen heavy fighting for months, reducing the once thriving place to ruins. CGTN's correspondent Stephanie Freed reports. Shelling in Bakhmut is relentless. The estimated 7,000 Ukrainians still living in this burnt-out carcass of a city are doing so under extreme conditions. We have nothing, no water, no windows. You can see that. We haven't had gas since the spring. There's no electricity, but it's my home. Where else am I supposed to go? Residents rely on volunteers who scurry into neighborhoods under fire and scramble to offload basic food, water and medical supplies. I performed here a number of times and had many friends here before the war. I'll keep coming until there's victory. Before the war, this salt mining city of 70,000 was a highway thoroughfare and a rail hub. The train station, downtown, the city streets and homes are now charred heaps mixed with broken glass. And the bloody battle, likened to World War I trench warfare, continues. The ongoing intensity of the fighting here lends itself to the natural assumption that this is a key strategic city. But according to military analysts, it's not. Bakhmut is not geopolitically central to the Kremlin's overall aims. And for Kyiv, its loss would complicate but not choke pushback against Russia. Despite the devastation and estimated dozens of military casualties on both sides every day, Bakhmut represents a psychological victory Russia needs. For Ukraine, it is a symbol of resistance and national unity. For the people fighting and living here, Bakhmut is hell. Stephanie Fried, CGTN, Bakhmut, Ukraine. Belarus has summoned Ukraine's ambassador for an explanation after claiming to have shot down a missile launched from Ukraine. The S-300 defense rocket was down 15 kilometers inside Belarusian territory. The incident happened during one of Russia's heaviest aerial onslaughts against Ukraine so far. Our correspondent Stuart Smith is in Moscow. Um, Stuart, just how significant is this uh, incursion into uh, Belarusian territory? Well, initially, it didn't seem very significant because the immediate response from a local official where the debris of this missile was found was that this was clearly an accident and that these things do happen. Indeed, it was the Belarusian military that shot down the air defense missile, but it landed in an empty agricultural field and no one was harmed when it fell. It's happened before in Poland and Moldova, and this seemed to be another example of that. But the Belarusian foreign ministry did indeed summon the Ukrainian ambassador to Minsk, asking for an explanation, demanding that it not happen again. 
and also saying that those that were responsible must be held accountable. Then on Friday, an even stronger statement came from one of the members of Belarus's Security Council, who suggested that there was little reason to believe that this was an accident, that by all appearances, uh, it seems some plan was being realized here. This particular uh, gentleman, Alexander Volfovich, is suggesting that Ukraine intended to provoke Belarus by allowing this missile to fall on Belarusian territory in order to create and escalate a regional conflict. As to what Ukraine was responding to, well, on Friday we heard for the first time what the Russian Ministry of Defense says it was doing, sending missiles, it says, to try to destroy military command and control systems as well as energy facilities that it believed were facilitating the Ukrainian military industrial complex. To that end, the Ministry of Defense said it achieved all its objectives, all the targets it were uh, trying to hit were successfully destroyed. And those were, first of all, transport links that were taking ammunition uh, from the West, foreign weapons from the West of Ukraine to the front lines. It prevented Ukrainian reserve forces traveling to the front lines and also destroyed a number of military equipment and ammunition production facilities in Ukraine. Stuart, thank you for that. Our correspondent Stuart Smith in Moscow. Former Prime Minister Tony Blair made extensive efforts to try and bring Vladimir Putin into the international fold. But the UK also had misgivings about the new Russian president, according to just released documents. Previously unseen papers from 2001, released by Britain's National Archives, show Blair believed his approach would encourage the newly elected Putin to adopt Western values and a Western economic approach. The papers also claim that Putin did not want to be viewed as anti-NATO, and he proposed that a gas pipeline be built across Belarus to the UK. Well, our correspondent Andrew Wilson is following the story for us. So, Andrew, these papers suggesting some early enthusiasm from the UK for the Russian president, but also perhaps some warning signs of what was to come. Yeah, I mean, everything that you just said in the introduction was true, and most of that was known pretty clearly anyway at the time. But it's interesting to have a look back. Really, those were the days. Tony Blair was uh, running the country at a time at Western enthusiasm for converting other nations to its way of thinking was at its peak. Now, Russia had been through since November 18th the gradual disintegration of the former Soviet Union, first of all with uh, Mikhail Gorbachev and then Boris Yeltsin. Moscow was filled with American businessmen looking to do deals for Coca-Cola and Ford Motor Company and all the rest of it. And there was something of a, a commercial takeover going on, which was greeted on the side of the West as being hands across the ocean meeting and, and like, mind, like minds coming together. Uh, but it was all about how was Vladimir Putin going to respond to this once Yeltsin imploded, he replaced him as, uh, as president. Now, all the early signs were that Vladimir Putin was quite enthusiastic. He made all the right noises. He met with Tony Blair in St. Petersburg. He met with then-President George Bush as well. Both of them came away saying they liked the guy. They had the good feeling for the guy. And Putin also did say to them at the time, look, I don't mind if NATO wants to do what NATO needs to do, because we know that in that time, so many of those Balkan country, uh, Baltic countries and so on moved over into NATO that had been part of the Warsaw Pact and all that sort of thing. But their relationship did go sour, and it was a lesson to the West that it doesn't automatically follow that just because a country starts to do business with you, that they will become mirrors of your own political system. And I think we've seen that again and again since then, but this was one of those big learning curves for the West and a bruising experience for Tony Blair, because if you go back to the newspapers at the time, there were words of warning coming from uh, the uh, defense advisor, John Sawyer, who became head of MI6 after that, saying you have to be careful uh, with how this is done. There are still plenty of Russian spies in the UK. This, all is not as it seems. But there was a wave of enthusiasm to the point that Vladimir Putin was presented with a set of number 10 cufflinks on one of the exchanges between the two leaders. And what else has been uh, revealed in these uh, previously unseen papers? I think what's most interesting is, is, the, is the spotlight back on that era, the switch of UK's relationship with the United States. Now, Bill Clinton was the, uh, the president when Tony Blair became prime minister, and those two famously struck up a very close relationship. And that is recorded in those papers, and that went on for the Good Friday Agreement and all the other collaborations that the White House and Downing Street had. And the special relationship flourished uh, at, at its time. Now, the idea was that... Al Gore as vice president would take over from Bill Clinton. That was the Democrats' plan. It didn't work. George W. Bush arrived on the scene. And famously, one of the last things that President Clinton said to Tony Blair as president was, 
try and get as close to this guy as you have been to me. In the event, Tony Blair became even closer to George W. Bush than he had been, and the two of them cooked up together the invasion of Iraq. And that was another uh, huge gesture of hubris that raised a question mark over this idea about how important intervention is from the West and how productive it actually is and so on. There were other stuff in the documents about Mo Molum, who was a very lively character, who was a Northern Ireland secretary. She was all pushing for the legalization of cannabis, but that was a step too far as far as the Blair administration was concerned and at one point there's a quote in those papers of uh, uh, the Blair administration referring to the UK media as being juvenile well we know there was quite a lot of fencing between the then political uh, communications advisor Alistair Campbell and the British media and a lot of that was over of course eventually uh, the causes and the lead up to the Iraq invasion which uh, went down in history as being a mistake but at the time was trumpeted by both the White House and Downing Street Andrew thank you very much our correspondent Andrew Wilson if you're watching CGTN, still ahead, Donald Trump paid little or no tax in recent years. We're in New York next, as some of the former president's accounts are published. Ever wondered what's the difference between a bear and a bull market? Where are the cash cows? And who are the lame ducks? And what exactly are black swans? Grey Rhinos and Unicorn Companies. Make sense of it all with Global Business, only on CGTS. There's a new agenda for a new world. Accelerating change in almost every part of our lives. It's shifting the norms of how we work. Travel and connect how we think interact and develop it's a new reality a new agenda with me Juliet Mann to Global Business Europe. Uh, Donald Trump paid little or no tax at all during uh, some of the years between 2015 and 2020, according to uh, documents just released. The former U.S. president's tax returns have been published by a Democrat-controlled committee investigating his finances. Well, our correspondent, John Terrett, is in New York. Uh, so, John, the returns are out. Uh, what do you make of them? They are... Well, we're snowed under here because there's hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages which have been released online only within the last two hours or so. This is the House Ways and Means Committee, which at the moment is controlled by the Democrats, but won't be as of next week. And basically, the House Ways and Means looks at all the purse strings, really, when it comes to the Congress from the House perspective. And the Democrats, who, as I say, control this committee, have been fighting tooth and nail for years now to get their hands on some of President Donald Trump's tax returns. And they even went all the way to the Supreme Court of the United States, the SCOTUS in Washington, D.C., and the court sifted through the evidence and said, yes, actually, you are able to have a look at these documents. President Trump, will you please hand them over? And he did. And the point about this is that Trump is the first president who has not voluntarily given away his tax secrets since President Nixon did the same back in the late 1960s and early 1970s. So now they are out, and they have hundreds of pages online right now, which have been heavily redacted, lots of black lines, so that secret information like social security numbers and addresses and phone numbers and things can't be seen. And they are six years' worth. It's the, it's the tax returns for the years 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, and 20. So that's six years in total. And from what I can see, they show that President Trump and his wife Melania invoked 
losses, huge losses actually, massive losses, and charity donations in order to pay as little as they possibly could up front in federal taxes. Now, an example of that would be in his first year in the White House, Donald Trump paid $750. $750 in tax, and he offset 13.13 million based on losses in his business empire. And in the year 2020, he paid zero federal tax, none whatsoever. But we, what we don't know is whether that's associated with COVID, because I'm not sure at what point in 2020 he actually had to make the filing. And of course, COVID-19 was well underway by then, so it's very difficult to know for certain. What we do know is that Alan Weisselberg, who was the money man over at the Trump Organization and who took part in a trial against that organization a couple of weeks ago, did say in the course of giving evidence that they knew they had to make the White House years, the tax returns, as squeaky clean as possible. So they did know that. One of the things that caught my eye is that in 2018, Trump had companies in the United Kingdom, in Ireland and in China. But by 2019, those companies have been whittled down to just the United Kingdom only. Now, the Democrats are accusing the Internal Revenue Service here, the IRS, the people that actually collect the taxes, of treating the Trump Organization and President Trump very, very lightly. Uh, and that's the point. That's why there's no criminal stench about this, because these taxes have been signed off on by the highest authorities in the land. You can't go back on them now. However, there's potentially a moral issue. That's for other people to make a decision over. And the Democrats have done this because it's their last day in which they control the House of Representatives after the midterm elections in November. From Tuesday, it will be a Republican-led House, very slim majority, but nonetheless a Republican-led House, and they can lead the proceedings in all sorts of ways. And I guess one of the, there's probably two things that they might do. One is they might, for example, invoke a law, or at least draw up a law, which says in future, can candidates running for the Oval Office must, by law, reveal their tax secrets so that the American people know exactly what's going on. And the other thing I think is almost certain to happen is that they will go after the Biden family now in the way that they think the Democrats have gone after the Trump family. It'll probably start on Tuesday. And John, we're coming to the end of 2022, of course. How will the year end on Wall Street? Uh, yes. Well, you know, here's a funny thing. You'll never know this. Nobody else, no other reporter would tell you this, okay? But in about two hours' time, all the traders down here on the floor are going to gather just over there where there's a camera, and they're going to sing the song, Wait Till the Sun Shines Nelly. OK, now, <laughs> Wait Till the Sun Shines Nelly is a World War II song, I think. This tradition stretches back to the 1930s and it goes back even further. And the, basically, they used to sing, when it was men only here, they used to sing during the day to keep themselves amused, some very bawdy songs. And Wait Till the Sun Shines Nelly is not bawdy at all, but it's the last survivor of that tradition. And they do it on the last trading day of the year. So they'll be doing that in a couple of hours' time. And then they will be going to have a very stiff drink quite frankly, Robin, because this has been a terrible year for stocks, OK? The Dow is down basically 10 percent, the Nasdaq basically 30 percent, and the S&P 500 basically 20 percent. And no one here can wait now until Tuesday, they're off on Monday, to Tuesday to get going again in 2023. It does seem as if it's going to be rough sailing for the first half of the year. Things are looking a lot better in the second half of the year. But I have to tell you, I have to tell you, very, very, very senior economists on Wall Street got 2022 very, very wrong. I mean, some of them had the S&P 500 way above 5,000 by now, and it's way down from that. So, you know, I've said before on this program, and I'll say it again, it is a bit of a horse race, really, here. <laughs> so we'll wait to see who the winner turns out to be. Well, John, a stiff drink and a sing song. Who knew? Only you uh, would have the insider <laughs> information from Wall Street for us. Our correspondent, John Tarrett, there in New York. I thought he was going to start singing the song. <laughs> I know, I wanted to hear the song, Small exactly. Mercies, anyway. <laughs> Uh, 2022 has also been a rather eventful year in politics uh, in the United States with surprising results in the midterm elections, yet more Donald Trump controversies and a Supreme Court ruling that shocked the world. Our correspondent Tony Waterman has been speaking to Juliet Mann. Yeah, I think there was a number of highlights to the 2022 political season, but really the two that stick out are the overturning of Roe v. Wade and the midterm elections, which really went hand in hand. So back in June, the Supreme Court reversed 
50 years of precedence. They got rid of a right, a woman's right to an abortion at a federal level, and they kicked that decision making back to the states. But this really unleashed this groundswell of anger, both uh, among Republicans and also among Democrats. Uh, poll after poll has shown that the vast majority of Americans do not want to see abortion access banned in the United States. So this really brought uh, out uh, people from both sides of the aisle. And uh, the reason is because this is really seen as a rights issue here in America. Americans love their personal rights. And this opened the question to what other rights could potentially be taken away. So the fact that it was framed like this really has allowed abortion to transcend party lines in a way that we have not seen uh, with other issues. And this fed directly into the midterm elections, this point in the election cycle where the party that is not in power normally gains a, a number of seats in Congress. And that red wave that was predicted did not happen this time around. It was really just a, a mere trickle at the end of the day. The Republicans were able to regain power in the House, but they failed to recapture uh, the Senate. And part of this was because of this decision out of the Supreme Court. Republicans and Democrats simply did not want to vote uh, for candidates who were going to, uh, in their personal state, who were going to deny this access uh, for women. Of course, the other big part of this uh, was the impending announcement from Donald Trump that he is once again going to be seeking re-election in 2024. Well, speaking of Donald Trump, well, on the one hand, it seems that he's increasingly isolated politically, but he's still making headlines. So what does the year ahead hold? Yeah, he certainly is. But I think at the end of the day, his chances of uh, political deterioration in 2023 far outweigh his chances of political success. And this is because there are a number of different factors at play here that we simply did not see in 2015 and 2016. Uh, most notably, I mean, he's not a novelty anymore. People know who he is. They know what type of president he is. They know how he reacts when he loses, how he represents the United States uh, abroad. He's also up against a number of legal challenges. He's facing investigations both at the federal and at the state level. There's also potentially uh, impending uh, criminal indictments that he's staring down. And the last thing is that there is actually a big political challenge that he is facing within his own party. Many of the Republican leadership uh, are now actively working against Donald Trump. They've just become so fed up with his election denialism uh, and the way that he conducts himself that they just don't want him to be representing the party any longer. And the voters are becoming increasingly disillusioned by Donald Trump and enthralled by Republican Governor uh, Ron DeSantis from Florida. There's been a number of polls that have shown that if they were, if Trump and DeSantis were, were facing off in an election uh, right now, that DeSantis would trounce Trump. So even among those likely GOP voters, he seems to be losing uh, a lot of support. But at the end of the day, this is Donald Trump. We cannot count him out, and anything is really possible in 2023. Now she dressed the world from China to Chelsea. Tributes have been paid to the fashion designer Dame Vivian Westwood after her death at the age of 81. The legendary designer made a name for herself as the queen of punk in the 1970s, going on to dress some of the biggest stars in fashion and building a multi-million dollar fashion empire. Well, Tamara Jinjik is founder and CEO of the fashion think tank Fashion Roundtable. Uh, good to have you on the program with us, uh, Tamara. So uh, Vivian Westwood, really an icon of British fashion. What has her influence been on the global industry? Um, thank you for having me on the show. I think it's um, very important to note that she ran an independent label. It was never bought out, as other labels have been, by larger conglomerates. So she certainly danced and ran her business to her own values and her own tune. Obviously, she started famously with the punk era in the 70s, but she continued in a, through several recessions, uh, both in the UK and globally, and always had a very loyal following from her customers. And I think they also bought into the values that she had, um, someone that espoused um, liberty and increasingly worked in, in climate activism um, towards the end of her life. And her brand uh, is really known around the world, isn't it? Uh, shops in many countries, including China, for example. Uh, how would you assess its global value? 
It's always had, I've, I've noticed in the industry, a very loyal following from the Chinese um, consumer. Um, you uh, see a lot of people going into the flagship in London um, who've come over from China to buy pieces. And I think what's really interesting about the brand is it had its own kind of vernacular language. So um, I'm wearing a jacket uh, by Vivian Westwood, and you can definitely see that there are themes running through her pieces, not only the punk aesthetic, but also the pie pirates um, with the buckled shoes and the way that you wore a certain kind of sloppy t-shirt and then the core sitting um, and I think that people and the kilts but they're very mini so there's that kind of British classical fabrics like tweed or tartan but then you know the the design is is completely offset with a with a, a punk aesthetic um, kind of irreverence so I think that that loyalty also she what she made beautiful uh, accessories and perfume so she has a very loyal following following and I don't think it can be underestimated. So uh, her own aesthetic then, is, uh, is that what's helped her stay relevant for so long? I mean, she's just been a fixture, hasn't she, in the fashion world for so many years? I think what's very, I've been thinking about this today, and I think what's really interesting is that she definitely um, attracted people who might have been a bit of an outsider um, and made them feel welcome and part of a community and wasn't afraid to stand up and, and speak about things, you know, um, although she famously dressed as Mrs. Thatcher um, for a cover of a magazine when Mrs. Thatcher was still in power, she also um, was quite irreverent in how she dressed when she collected her gong from the Queen or, you know, when she met Mrs. Thatcher or other politicians, she, she went to David Cameron's um, house, close to his house in a tank, and she stood up for justice um, politically and environmentally. So I think that people who maybe might not have felt part of a more kind of corporate um, fashion industry definitely felt a part of what she had to say and I think that's what keeps you current and attractive as well if you're if you're constantly pushing boundaries I mean famously I, I've had her press release from her uh, in the wake of her death yesterday um, and she's talking about capitalism and that's a very radical place for a, a designer to be and I think that that's part of why people are so loyal to her so what do you think her legacy will be how will she be remembered Hopefully, we'll see. I mean, I note that Matty Boven, who's a young British designer, is definitely someone I see in the kind of lineage of, of the work that she created at her own house and label. I think that she definitely um, set the benchmark very high for uh, understanding British design, fabrication and history and then mixing it up and making it more current and therefore... Um, accessible but also desirable like what she did with corsets but also what she did um with those famous pirate boots that you'll see many pictures of kate moss wearing over the years and i think that those pieces are are, are still attractive they still feel fresh and i, I don't think that it's going to be, it's ne it's certainly not been a one-hit wonder we've had uh, what is it 50 years nearly now of, of her being in the industry um and given that she's just brought in Jeff Banks, who was one of her early heroes as one of the directors of the company. I don't see it going anywhere, anywhere, anytime fast. Tom Rodinjik from Fashion Roundtable. Uh, good to talk to you. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you so much. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Following Italy's lead, Spain imposes restrictions on travellers from China. We'll have the latest on those COVID checks next. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you all around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi and London. China Global Television Network. Stories from across the globe, reaching people 
across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. Facing the unknown is always difficult. In a world in turmoil, it's easy to lose orientation. But when the storms come, we have to see the possibilities. Reinvent. Find new opportunities. Discover a path forward. CGTN. See the difference. What do we mean when we talk about the difference? The difference is in the detail, in the background, defense ministers from the wider angle and perspective of every story, wherever the story may be. CGTN. See the difference. Welcome back to Global Business Europe with Jamie Owen and Robin Dwyer. Our top story, fighting intensifies in the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, where the few remaining residents are struggling without power or water. China's President Xi Jinping has been speaking to Russian President Vladimir Putin. President Xi said trade between the two countries was strengthening at a record high for uh, the last 11 months of this year. They also talked about enhancing visitor exchanges and deepening cooperation on the global stage. Ukraine was also a key issue during this discussion. The video call came as China appointed a new foreign minister. Well, I've been talking to our correspondent in Beijing, Dong Shui. This is another high-level exchange and comes after the two met in Uzbekistan this September, where both leaders mentioning it's become a tradition for them to speak in the run-up to the new year, where they both uh, expressed a willingness to the, uh, for the bilateral ties to move forward and to enhance cooperation in various fields such as trade, energy, finance, and agriculture. And when it comes to the Ukraine crisis, um, President Xi Jinping said that China will continue to uphold an objective position to promote a common approach by the international community to play a constructive role in peacefully resolving the Ukraine crisis. And she also said that he recognized that Russia has maintained it is open to a negotiated settlement. Well, during the uh, video conference, President Xi had also stressed that against the backdrop of a difficult uh, international situation, China is ready to increase political cooperation with Russia. Uh, China Jenny. has a new uh, foreign minister. Uh, what's the significance uh, of his appointment? To many, Qing Gang is uh, the a familiar name since he took the job as China's ambassador to the United States a year ago. But Qing was well known before that as he served as the uh, spokesperson for China's foreign ministry over a decade ago. Well, many credit him with developing a brash, more sharply confident communication style than previously seen. Well, in his early uh, career, he has also served in various attaches and senior positions in the UK and Western Europe, where he promoted scientific exchanges and cooperation between, you know, those two countries. And, and, and as ambassador to the United States, he's, he had uh, dealt with tense bilateral relations, which he has seen, you know, a trade dispute. He's uh, spent many hours visiting U.S. officials, promoting cultural exchanges. Uh, for example, he was seen at the uh, Los Angeles Clippers game, promoting the winter, uh, Beijing Winter Olympics, and speaking to farmers in Iowa. So I think there's um, high expectations for him as foreign minister, given the changing international landscape, and he will be leading. Uh, he will be a leading figure in how to continue to promote China's image and the view of the world. Spain has joined Italy, imposing COVID restrictions on travelers arriving from China. This comes as the rest of Europe debates how to handle passengers from China which has lifted its own travel restrictions, allowing people to travel freely after years of lockdowns. 
China is currently battling a wave of coronavirus cases. Our correspondent Peter Oliver is in Berlin. Um, Peter, tell us more about uh, these restrictions. Yes, more hoops to jump through for people travelling from China to Spain. Now, they follow on from measures that were put in place by Italy that will require extra checks for passengers arriving on flights from China. What it means for those arriving in Spain, according to their uh, health minister, is that anybody arriving needs to provide a negative COVID test or proof that they have been fully vaccinated. In making the announcement, though, the Spanish health minister said that they wanted to see a unified approach to this across the whole of the European Union. We know of the importance of coordinated action, but we are also aware of the importance of acting quickly. That is why, at a European level, we will push for the need to revise the recommendation to request the digital COVID certificate or equivalent from travelers from China as the best safety guarantee for all. But that unified following on from what's being done by China, by, uh, beg your pardon, by uh, Italy and now Spain isn't going to be coming at an EU level any time soon. We heard on Thursday after a meeting of the EU Health Security Committee. Now, that's the body we heard from an awful lot during COVID, uh, during the major COVID outbreaks here in, in Europe. They're made up of uh, representatives from the health ministries of all of the, the EU member states and chaired by the EU Commission saying that there was no plans to do anything like that at an EU level just yet, saying to do so right now would be unjustified. They quoted from um, the European Centre for Disease Control saying that across the EU there was sufficient high population immunity, is the way they call it, and say that the current wave of COVID infections in China was not set to cause any major disruptions or any effective disruptions across Europe as far as they could tell right now. In fact, what we did hear from a number of EU member states we're looking at Portugal, France and from Germany, where I'm speaking to you from, saying they didn't want to see this at all, that it would be a step back to try and place these type of restrictions on travellers from China. Austria highlighting the importance of the tourism industry. It is, of course, ski season, uh, saying that it was important to get more travellers from China to be able to come here to Europe and to do so easily, putting in place restrictions, not the way forward. They certainly don't want to see it at an, an EU-wide level. Peter, how has uh, China responded? Well, not happy at all. If you listen to what's coming out of the, the media in China, we've seen various articles written describing these measures as unfounded and discriminatory against travellers from China. There's also a feeling that this is an attempt in some way to try and undermine the, the lifting of restrictions that's being put in place. After three years, China, of course, had some of the, the toughest restrictions that were put in place to stop the spread of COVID. They've decided now's the time to lift those and that this isn't helping matters at all by putting in place, as I mentioned, more hoops for travellers to jump through as they try and come from China to Europe, particularly to those two countries of Spain and Italy. Peter, thank you for that. Our correspondent, Peter Oliver, in Berlin. Indonesia has announced it's lifting all COVID control measures. President Joko Widodo said the change is because most of the country's population already has antibodies against the disease. The announcement means the scrapping of all indoor mask wearing and the COVID tracker app. Aung San Suu Kyi has been sentenced to a further seven years in jail by a court in Myanmar. The country's former democratically elected leader has been under house arrest since her government was ousted in a military takeover two years ago. She now faces a total of 33 years in jail following previous convictions for charges including corruption, which have been condemned as fabricated by many international governments and human rights groups. Colombia's Navy has seized four and a half tons of cocaine after intercepting two submarines. The drugs, with a street value of more than $150 million, is the largest cocaine seizure this year. Several suspects, at least two of which were from Ecuador, had attempted to sink the vessels as they were being apprehended. It's a dark chapter in the UK's Second World War history, a story of racial prejudice that uh, resulted in broken families, lost heritage, and a fight to make British authorities apologize. Thousands of Chinese seamen now serving with the Allied Merchant Navy, bringing food to Britain, munitions from America. 
Chinese sailors based in Liverpool served alongside Allied soldiers and were forcibly repatriated when the war ended. Hundreds of men vanished overnight, leaving behind their wives and their children without any explanation of where they'd gone. I've been talking to some of those families in our documentary, The Secret Betrayal. Sarah Owen is a member of parliament who's working with the families and who believes racism is still endemic in the UK. Why do I think it happens? Ultimately through racism. And when it comes to East and Southeast Asian racism, the UK has been far behind acknowledging the level of racism that is levelled at Chinese people, East Asians and Southeast Asians. We saw the racism of old that saw these Chinese seamen deported rear its ugly head again over the last two years of the COVID pandemic. And what I want to ensure is that we learn from those past mistakes so that we do not continue to have resurgences of racism against our communities because it hadn't gone away. It wasn't like COVID was something new. It was just like it was racism on steroids against us. Now, I have a little girl, and what I don't want to see is that she is subjected to the same racism in this country that other generations have been as well. And you can watch the full documentary by going to cgtn.com slash the secret betrayal. You're watching CGTN still ahead. Farewell to the king. Brazil and the world mourns after the death of football superstar Pele. I fell in love with Chinese culture the second I started to experience it. 70 years ago, a small group of British businessmen travelled to China to unlock opportunities between the two countries. They became known as the icebreakers. Building bridges is a natural thing. There is no age and gender difference in our spirit, no race difference in our soul. I think food is an incredible way of bringing different cultures together. I am enjoying learning every aspect about it. Chinese literature stretches back for millennia, but it's still really relevant for today. I hope that Chinese and the British fashion community could be more frequently communicating with each other. An incredible mix of people, cultures, food, and there is so much to see and so much to do. I have a great desire to make the Chinese civilization more accessible. It's about our future, our future generation's future. The craftsmanship, the technique, the material uses, the color uses. You can kind of take things on board and continue to develop and grow. Meet the bridge builders, the individuals who dare to think beyond the horizon and open up our world. Everything seems to have a story. I just think that's absolutely beautiful. A huge tick. Welcome back to Global Business Europe. Uh, climate change and protecting nature were uh, the subject of two United Nations global summits this year. Isabel Hilton, founder of China Dialogue, followed both COP27 and COP15 closely. I asked her whether they really achieved anything. These events are often criticised as talking shops, but there are, I think there are two important things to remember. One, we don't get things done as a global community unless we talk. And, and secondly, if you don't think that these meetings matter, imagine where we'd be if none of them had happened. Uh, we would be way past a lot of the tipping points in climate. We wouldn't have energy transition options, all of the things that have been developed as a result of these scientific reports and of the UNFCCC process that has tried to move the global agenda on on climate. So they really definitely matter. Um, it's a global problem without a global conversation, and the UN is the only place where a global conversation can happen. We really, uh, we really don't have anywhere that, that everyone who matters uh, gets to take part. 
Having said that, yes, of course, there are frustrations and there are conflicting interests. Um, there are countries, especially the fossil fuel big producers, who try to slow things down as much as they can. But they did do one really important thing, which was finally, after years of discussion, set up a loss and damage fund for vulnerable countries who are suffering the effects of climate change. And that will, I hope, help them to make the right choices about their own development. The other COP was, of course, COP15. This has been a very unlucky COP. Uh, it's chaired by China, not the reason for its lack of luck. But it's been unlucky in the sense that it was very much hit by uh, the, the global pandemic, so the meetings that should have happened, the travel that should have happened, the diplomatic preparation all got very difficult. And it, it's a really important one because it's setting action for the next decade. Action for the previous decade didn't work. All the targets were missed. So what we were looking for in this one was a, a deal, which, which we got. But the question will be, will it be implemented? So all eyes were on China for the deal, and I guess a lot of eyes will still be on China uh, to see if this is a robust enough mechanism. In 2022, we saw some extreme temperatures, record temperatures in some places, extreme weather. What about next year? What's the outlook? Well, I'm afraid the outlook is that this will continue. Uh, you know, we have set climate change in motion and uh, it will continue. And that's one of the frustrating things about dealing with climate change is that we're always talking about the future, but the present is really catching up with us. So what we're looking for, of course, is that emissions will peak. And uh, some countries have peaked their emissions some time ago. Some countries will uh, hopefully peak their emissions soon, China being the biggest emitter and certainly the one that everyone will be looking for for as early a peak as possible. It's committed to well before 2030, and the earlier that comes, the better it is for everybody. But the climate impacts that we've set in train, I'm afraid those will continue. You don't just turn them off with a magic switch. And there are things, for example, um, ice melt, which is hugely important in the global system. It affects the weather, it affects the oceans, it, it affects everything. You can melt ice very quickly, but a kind of refreeze at a planetary level, that could take millennia. So we will have to do a lot of adjustment and we will have to be very realistic about what is facing us with the amount of warming we have now. At the same time, to avoid worse effects, we have to we have to up the ambition and let it all become far more far more urgent really tributes are being paid around the world to the brazilian football superstar pele who's died at the age of 82 he died after a long battle with cancer nicknamed the king pele was reg was regarded as one of the greatest footballers of all time and is the only player to have won the world cup 3 times brazil has declared 3 days of national mourning well, let's talk to our correspondent, Paulo Cabral, who is in Sao Paulo. Uh, so, Paulo, there's been an outpouring of grief for somebody who was truly a Brazilian icon. Oh, certainly so, all over the world, and more so uh, here in Brazil. Of course, it did not come as a total surprise. He was struggling against cancer, and over the last uh, couple of weeks, it became uh, more and more clear that it would be getting to time of saying goodbye to the king of football here in Brazil. And that's what people uh, have been doing, of course, during his life. He did stir some controversies, both for his political opinions as also some facts of his personal life but that's not what's being talked about today but about his importance for football with his world championships his almost 1300 goals scored uh, during his career and the importance that Pelé has and still uh, have and still has to the construction of Brazil as a nation it was June 1958 the World Cup in Sweden Edson Arantes do Nascimento, known as Pelé, was just 17. From the start, he was artistry in motion. He led his team to victory in the finals, and football fans would never forget him. In 2014, the Brazilian port city of Santos, home to the professional football club where Pelé played most of his career and where he rose to fame, honored its favorite son by officially opening the Pelé Museum. A person in vida. We are used to seeing people being heavily criticized when they are alive because we are all humans and make mistakes. 
and then they become angels after they die. This is why I am so happy to be honored by this museum, because I am still here, in very good health. The collection tells his story from his early days as a shoeshine boy in the Brazilian countryside to the glories of his three World Cup wins through his retirement in 1974, but then being lured back to the field to play for the New York Cosmos the following year. His final game was played in 1977, when he led his team to the league championship. People compare Pelé to Maradona, Di Stefano and Messi. But that's actually a matter of technology. Maradona played in the age of satellite TV. Messi has got it all, including the internet. Pelé played at a time when he could rely only on smoke signals. The world doesn't know 1% of what Pelé has done. Here in São Paulo's Football Museum, the section dedicated to Pelé is among the most visited. O Pelé foi um marco, né, do esporte mundial. Pelé was a milestone for world sports. A poor kid who managed to grow to leave his mark in football and is the biggest icon of Brazil. He was certainly the biggest idol we have ever had in our sports. A true phenomenon. I don't even have the words to describe he is a world idol. When Pelé turned 80 years old, he was interviewed for Brazil's football league, the CBF, where he reflected on, among other things, the reasons for his success. Why God? Why was I chosen? It's hard to explain because all my life I just wanted to be like my father, Don Nino. And God gave me this gift of everything that happened in my life. So sometimes I just can't explain. It's hard. Now the king is gone, and it doesn't seem there is yet anyone to wear his crown. Paolo Cabral reporting on the death of football legend Pele, who's died aged 82. Now, throughout this year, we've been uh, meeting people who've dedicated their lives to building relationships between China and the UK, bringing the two countries closer together. Sean Gibson is a British singer-songwriter who combines both Chinese and Western music. 70 years ago, a small group of British businessmen travelled to China. They became known as the Icebreakers. Now meet the bridge builders, the individuals continuing the icebreaker spirit to open up our world. Hello, my name is Sean Gibson. I'm a British singer-songwriter currently based in Beijing. I've lived in China now for on and off for about the last five years. Well, about eight years ago now, I took my first trip to China and I went to Beijing, Shanghai, Hangzhou, Nanjing, Chongqing, Chengdu, Xi'an, and then back to Beijing. It was whilst I was in Chengdu, I saw uh, a pipa player for the first time. And this made me really fascinated because I'd, I'd heard pipa before in in the UK, but it was always presented to me as an expression of history or like just an ancient instrument. But seeing that there in the shopping centre with a whole crowd of people around, I realised it's not only still part of modern Chinese culture, but it's still very, very popular. And I thought that is fascinating. So I became very, very inspired and I just wanted to start putting these kind of traditional Chinese instruments into my own music. My music career in China, well, actually kind of started off in the UK. I make music and I make videos because it enriches my life, but also I hope that I can make other people happy as well, and I hope that I can share uh, Chinese culture with my Western friends. Um, and things are going really well. You know, I'm getting invited to do more TV shows now and interviews like this, so more people are kind of getting to know me, which is really exciting. Walking down this busy street where the lights turn way down low. I sing in Chinese and English because at the moment most of my followers are Chinese, so it makes sense to sing in Chinese. But also it gives me a deeper understanding of the culture as well. <laughs> And I, I write in English as well because I still have this hope that one day uh, more of my Western friends can know my music. So by writing in different 
in two different languages, it connects with different groups of people. And also, my Chinese followers also like to listen to my English songs because it can help them to practice their English. <laughs> The first time I came here, I did have culture shock, but it wasn't the culture shock in the way that you'd kind of expect. I expected China to be totally different to the UK, like totally different. And actually, when I arrived, I just felt familiar. It just felt like people are living their lives just normally. So I go to the park and I see people exercising, but it's just different types of exercises. So it made me realize actually people are just people. You know, I've come halfway around the world, but people are doing the same things. For me, the most inspiring thing in Chinese music is just how different it is to Western music, because Western music is very rhythm-based, it's very rhythmically based, very electronic now as well. So it's kind of digital and cool and fashionable and all of that. But it's lost that kind of heart and soul to some degree, I think. Traditional Chinese music is totally melody orientated and Western music is totally rhythmically orientated. So I think these two contrasts, when put together, are really, really fascinating. It creates something really fresh. <laughs> I'm really big into this whole Zhongguo Feng kind of Chinese style inspired music because I think that to me sounds really fresh and new. The environment here is perfect for making music videos. The kind of songs I write perfectly suit that kind of traditional, you know, the big um, forbidden city, the Tian Tan. The Heaven Temple and the parks and things like that, you know, the white fences and the red walls, things like that. It just totally suits my style. If we only treasure them all. China is one country that's full of so many different cultures that it, it's almost like, you can say it's like more like 56 different countries in one country. It's amazing. It really is amazing. And British people don't know that. So I hope in the next 50 years or so that can, that can change. And I think the only way to do that sensibly is to integrate Chinese culture into Western culture slowly. You know, it's got to have relevance to people. So it's how do you combine Chinese and Western influences together to create something new, to create something that both parties can enjoy equally. We can share and realize that the human race is just that, it's the human race. We really need to start building bridges instead of walls and to focus a lot more on our similarities than our differences. So I'm writing uh, songs with Chinese influence, with Chinese instruments. I'm, I'm, I'm exploring, I'm experimenting, I'm trying something new, all in the hopes to build a bridge. And I think we definitely need more people doing that, a lot more people doing that, um, on both sides. The headlines again. Fighting intensifies in the Ukrainian city of Bakhmut, where the few remaining residents are struggling without supplies of power or water. China's President Xi and Russia's President Vladimir Putin hold video talks on trade, geopolitics and the war in Ukraine. And Spain is now requiring visitors from China to produce a negative COVID test or be fully vaccinated on arrival. Well, that's it for Global Business Europe. Thank you for watching. More on all of our stories at europe.cgtn.com and do follow CGTN Europe on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. We're on Smart TV apps, Roku, Apple TV, Amazon Fire and Android TV. YouTube, Dailymotion, cgtn.com and the CGTN app. And in the UK, on Freeview. Coming up next on CGTN, it's Africa Live. We'll see you again on Monday, same time, same place. From all of the team in London, it's goodbye. Goodbye.